All right, uh, Revelation chapter 2, please. Revelation chapter 2. We're going to look at Revelation 2 and 3. And I'll be preaching on the seven churches in Revelation. A lot of people have heard about these seven churches in Revelation. The seven churches in Revelation, we know that they have tribulation doctrine and application. Uh, but we also know that there are three applications we can learn from this. One is the doctrinal application, which is for specifically those in the end times, the tribulation. The second application is historical. John was writing literally to seven churches during his time period at the first centuries. The third application is the spiritual application, where we can see ourselves in each of these seven churches, and some have laid it out to seven time periods in the church age. We'll be looking through all of these things and learn some valuable lessons, historically, spiritually, and doctrinally. Amen. We're gonna, uh, we turned the book to Revelation 2. I think it'll be best to start off at Revelation chapter 1, where he introduces the seven churches. But we'll occasionally look at 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 1, and we'll read verse 11 saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So notice that John here, he is writing literally to seven churches uh, that are in Asia Minor. So these are people who are receiving these verses, these letters directly from the Apostle John. And John is giving them specific instructions to see, to hear, and to learn. Can you imagine yourself being one of those seven churches? The Apostle John, he has been exiled in the island of Patmos. Because he was exiled in the island of Patmos, being one of those seven churches, you can imagine, oh, the Apostle John, I finally hear word from him. Imagine if your pastor was exiled or imprisoned, uh, already just being gone for a Sunday and a Wednesday. Some of you want to hear the preaching and teaching from me, which is very encouraging to me. But imagine if it was gone for many months to years, and then the pastor wrote a letter to this church. You obviously want to pay special attention. You'd obviously make time, no matter how busy the schedule, to come to that meeting day in church so that the person can read off the letter of what your pastor wants to say to this church. A lot of people, you can imagine, came here. They have their ears open to the specific instruction and letter of what God wants them to hear. Imagine that the pastor mentioned that this is actually from God himself. He wants me to write another book of the Bible. You would have your ears definitely open. You would definitely pay attention. You would definitely say, well, there are some things that I can apply to my life, that I can change, and that I can do. I want these things in my life. It's amazing, however, every single church, when you look at today, perhaps does not have a Bible-believing church. You go to all seven churches, it's an apostate area. The gospel is not fervently preached. There's no Bible-believing truth spread out. There may be, don't get me wrong, there may be some scatters here and there. But when's the last time, if you're going to talk about a Bible-believing church that everyone looks up to, when did you hear Laodicea? That city has been used most to condemn what a Bible-believing church should not become. Right. When did you hear Ephesus before? Why is it that you have to hear churches in the Southern Belt, for example? Or people who watch us online to hear something going on in, what, San Francisco Bay Area? For a Bible-believing church. Why is it not Sardis? Why is it not Thyatira? Why is it not Smyrna? Why is it that all these churches are not the first in our mind for the ideal church as Bible-believing churches? It shows the apostasy that has spread. Yeah. 
how they did not apply the word of God that was pr directly preached at them. They did not apply it. They didn't learn from it. But I guarantee you, if you and I were in their shoes, and then we heard, hey, the Apostle John is writing the last book of the Bible, and he's got something specifically sent from God. We haven't seen him for years, and he's been away. I can't wait to hear the word of God being preached. I believe all of them in those churches had the exact same hearts like you right now Amen. who want to hear the word of God being Amen. preached. Amen. They did. But why aren't they the churches today that are fired up, that are ideal for us to follow, that didn't follow the word of God? I thought that they wanted to hear the word of God. I thought that they originally, they were like, I can't wait to hear it. And then they probably had altar calls. They probably changed their lives. They probably applied the things and they probably remembered and listened to the word of God. But why did it not really affect their lives that they're now apostate? Why is it that people in our church today would come in with the same hunger for the Word of God? You sacrificed time. You made an effort to come to church. You dressed your best. You prepared your heart and mind. You prayed up before the preaching. But like Sardis, Thyatira, Laodicea, and the other churches, are we like them where we come in with hunger, with a passion, desire to hear the word of God? But in reality, we don't. We ignore the word of God. We reject the word of the Lord. And the word of God comes and falls out void in our lives and does no good. Will we be like that? Why? Why did we become like that? You might wonder. Let's all bow in a word of prayer and then perhaps the Holy Spirit can give us some light on why. Father God, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood? Here's the sermon that you wanted me to preach and I will preach it, Father. Fill within me your power. I need everything of you. Father, we need to hear from your word. Lord, we all came here wanting to hear your word. But sadly, perhaps we don't realize that we actually don't. Perhaps... We don't realize that those words where we thought we had a desire actually don't really mean much to us. May this sermon open our eyes. May we become a church that will truly hear your words and believe your words and follow your words and uh, glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 2. He is speaking to, let's look at all seven churches. He speaks to the church in Ephesus, right, at verse 1? Yeah. All right. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Imagine that the pastor of the church says, unto Danielle Seeley write. Then she would go, ah, like that. Unto Robert Garcia, he would go, oh, like that. They would pay special attention. And they would actually even appreciate God would mention them in the letter. A lot of people would. But then Ephesus, why did they fall to pieces at the end? Their territory, it is said that when Muhammad came down centuries later with his horses, they all trampled underneath their feet. Below them were the ruins of the church of Ephesus. And it became a place of uh, Muslim territory and dominion during that time. How did Ephesus end up in that kind of a state? Verse 7 Notice what God says to the church of Ephesus. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Why did God say to Ephesus, okay, here's what I'm going to say to you. And the Ephesus church is like, oh, I, I, I'm going to listen to this one. Wouldn't God know that the people in the church of Ephesus would go, oh, I want to hear this? So why would he say, if you have an ear, let him hear? Of course they're going to hear, Lord. Who wouldn't want to hear from you, especially if it's the last book of the Bible, especially if God is speaking, especially out of so many other churches John could write, he wrote it to Ephesus. Who wouldn't hear? Why would God have to say that? Unless God knew they really didn't want to hear. Unless God really knew that, yeah, they think they want to hear, but they actually don't. 
Maybe they do want to hear, but they really have a fleshly problem where something's blocking them that they don't hear. Whatever the case is, whatever the point is, the bottom line is God knew that, hey, you have to pay attention because you have a tendency to don't. So that's why God said, he that, then here, let him hear. But notice, God said that with every single church. Every single church. They, uh, they have a hearing problem. God wanted them to hear. Look at verse 8. Smyrna, he's speaking. <clears throat> but then verse 11, he that hath and hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Look at verse 12, third church, Pergamos. God is speaking to the church in Pergamos. But verse 17, he concludes the same way. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Look at verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write. So fourth church, Thyatira. But look how God concludes again in verse 29. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Then chapter 3, fifth church, Sardis. Chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. But God concludes again in verse 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Then Philadelphia at verse 7. Philadelphia, the church. <coughs> God concludes the same thing. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches at verse 13. Verse 13. Now we're in chapter 3, verse 14. He's speaking to the church of the Laodiceans. Concludes the same thing. Verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. God would not say that unless he knows that these people would have a tendency to not hear. God urges you today to hear his voice speaking to you. A lot of times we would think we would hear his voice. If John was to read out the letter, perhaps some of you, you and I, would pay attention to every word, would not fall asleep, would make sure that our ears are open, and pay attention to the Word of God. Like right now, what you're doing. You're trying to hear every word. You're trying to pay attention. You won't let the devil interfere. But in spite of that, God says to you, if you have an ear, can you hear what I'm telling you? What the problem with people today is that they do not have ears to hear. The Bible talks about many times where people would hear the word of God, but it doesn't click in their head like the Jews at Acts 28. There are other passages where the disciples paid attention to what Jesus spoke. They even asked questions so that they can make sure they understand. But Jesus said that, why are your hearts hard? See, there are things in life where we think we would hear the word of God being preached, but you are still shutting out the Holy Spirit of God and the word is not singing down on you. You might say, why is that preacher? Why is that? What are you trying to tell me? I think that I'm hearing the word of God. You think? You think? There are times that I've been to churches and that there would be a sermon that I would hear or people who would hear me preach. And then after I preached the sermon, they would come to me and thank me for the sermon being preached, Amen. which is great, which is wonderful. But, you know, I wonder if they really took that sermon and found some things that they need to change their life, where they knew God was directly speaking right at them at that issue. I can teach a history class and you can thank me for the history lesson learned, or, when you hear the history lesson learned, while I'm teaching that history lesson, you could perhaps hear the Holy Spirit pricking your heart and saying, you see that? That preacher was able to do that. Why weren't you able to do that? See that knowledge right there where Pastor Kim dropped a little nugget? I mean, why don't you see that one? Why wasn't that applied in your life? Do you see how wicked this world is that Pastor Kim dropped a little thing right there? Why didn't you write a note on that one? Why is it that uh, weeks later you forgot? And then you heard another preacher preaching the same thing Pastor Kim said, but you forgot what Pastor Kim said, and then you only heard that other preacher what he said. Wow. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. Did you really hear the Word of God? Wow. Or are you just hearing? It's good preaching, brother. Just hearing. Why is it that people come down on the altar when 
Okay, that sermon hit me right there. I'll come down. Look, you can come down on the altar to thank God for something in the message too. Maybe there is a sermon that God is not trying to convict or change your heart, but something you should remember and thank God for on the altar. Because that sermon was for you, not for them. The problem with people today is that when a sermon is being preached, we have to feel like that there must be a sermon that directly applies to us that where we feel it. But my friend, that's just flesh. That's flesh. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart right now in the preaching, but you're too blind to see it. You're too deaf to hear it. Preach. Preach. Why is it that people come down on the altar for some sermons? Were those other sermons not applying to you? The Holy Spirit chose those other sermons you didn't come down on the altar where the Holy Spirit wasn't speaking to you that day? I thought every Sunday, every teaching, it should be something the Holy Spirit is trying to tell. Not him. Not her. Me. 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 You should come into the church as if the preaching, the teaching was specifically designed for you. Wow. As if everything, there must be something you should learn, should apply, should change, should remember, should perform. Are you like that when you come to church? Or you have to feel something where, okay, uh, it was applying to me, I'll get right with God. Why does a preacher have to yell his voice even louder so that you can feel the conviction? Why does a preacher have to do hand motions, point out who is sitting so that you can feel the conviction? Why is it that the preacher must give some kind of sob story illustration so your heart can be tugged so that you can feel the Holy Spirit? Can't you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now? But the problem is when people come to church, the sermon's not for me. The sermon's not for me. The sermon was for so-and-so. The sermon was good food for thought. The sermon was something good that, you know, I could probably carry in my life. No, the sermon was directly to you. When the preacher preaches, it's got to be something like, that is me. Directly, specifically designed for me. There is something in my life that I failed to do for you, Lord Jesus Christ. There is something in my life that I may have done well, but the preacher is still preaching that to remind me, to keep in mind. You're speaking to me. Why, Lord? Why are you speaking to me? Do you think like that? Or do you think that the preacher is just br bringing you a sermon? Just giving you a teaching? Because it's part of the sequence, part of his series that he set up. Because he thinks it's between him and God to preach to the people, but not for you. Why do you have to think that way? Why can't you think, that is for me? He is speaking to me. That sin applies to me. That conviction applies to me. That is me and there's nobody else in your mind but you. You know what you should be doing? You should picture it as if when you come to this church, no one is in this room except you. And that the preaching of the word of God is looking right at you. The finger is pointing right at you. And the conviction is pointing right at you. Amen. That's what you should be doing. Amen. God is speaking to me. Do you have ears to hear? Do you hear the Holy Spirit? Or all you're hearing is yelling? All you're hearing is words from Gene Kim. Can't you hear the Holy Spirit right now knocking on your heart? Hey, hey, hey! It's you! Why won't you change that? Why won't you repent? Why can't you apply that? Can you hear the Holy Spirit? Speaking to you. Look at uh, Samuel. Look at 1 Samuel. First Samuel chapter 3. The famous passage about hearing God's voice. Samuel, he heard God speaking to him. He heard him. But his problem was he had a misdirection of God's voice. Okay, hear what I'm telling you right now. Samuel heard God speaking, but he had a misdirection, a misapplication of what God was saying. 
Look at 1 Samuel chapter 3. Look at verse 4. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he fled to the Lord. No. He ran unto Eli and said, Here am I. For thou, not the Lord, thou callest me. And he said, I call not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not my son. Lie down again. For Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. What? Did you read that? I thought the word of the Lord was revealed to him. I thought Samuel heard. Why did the verse say the word of the Lord was not yet revealed to him? Because he had a misapplication of the word of the Lord. He went to Eli. He thought it was Eli speaking to him, not the Lord. Hey, friend, uh, why do you think Gene Kim is speaking to you right now? Why do you think the illustrations, the uh, pointed parts, the tone of my voice, the yelling, the hand motions, whatever, is all from Gene Kim? Why can't you see me as a, merely as an instrument the Lord is speaking through? Trying to tell you, show you something. Can't you hear God telling you from the back crevices of your heart that you've always shut out and you've forgotten that God said right there. Right there. You see that? You see that? But no, that's, uh, you know, uh, the Lord's not talking about that, you might say, because Gene Kim is talking about a different subject. That's not his main point, you might say. So then you miss out God speaking to you. You ever seen it before where I'm preaching a sermon or teaching something, and then, uh, I don't know if you ever saw it, but some person would come to me and say, man, thank you for that. I had this, this problem. So that sermon, that teaching helped me. And then I'm like, oh, I didn't know about that. Well, praise the Lord. I had no intention in that sermon and teaching to do such a uh, conviction or a change or an understanding that the other person thought of. Because I have no idea what's going on in that person's life. I have no idea what's going on with every nook and cranny in your lives. Right. Yes. But the Lord knows. Yes. And the Lord's using this message to speak to that and meet those things. Yes. How many people I met that said, you know, that was a sermon that changed my life. That was a sermon that made me uh, keep coming to this church. I was struggling with something and God used that to speak to me. You got to realize, friend, it's not Gene Kim, it's God. You've seen that so many times. Amen. If you've seen that so many times, you have to realize this. Gene Kim right now is saying stuff he has no idea about, but is merely a piano that the Holy Spirit is putting his fingers on every key that is reaching the right notes that ministers directly right at you. Good. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You hear that song playing? You see that Holy Spirit striking those chords and it's hitting you. Yes. And I'm just simply an instrument, a piano. Amen. Amen. I'm not trying to draw you into this altar. I'm not trying to convict you or change you. But the Holy Spirit is and you are shutting him out with the excuse of Gene Kim. Look at him. He's young. Look at him. He's not talking about that. Look at him. Uh, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's probably talking about my thing and my weakness right here. So then uh, that don't apply to me. And then, see, that's your problem. All you're looking at is Gene Kim and not the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you right now. You know God is speaking to you. I know every one of you, every one of you, including yours truly, God has something he's trying to tell us. But you're shunning him out. Because your excuse is Gene Kim's the one that's speaking. He didn't preach a convicting enough. He missed a point right there. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what the sermon is about. See, you, all you're looking at is Gene Kim. You're not looking at the Holy Spirit. Because every sermon that might have my main point, my main subject, could be a different subject that the Holy Spirit is trying to reach to you about. That you're avoiding. <coughs> Notice right here. What Eli said as we keep reading on. Verse 9. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, 
and it shall be if he call thee that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. <clears throat> so Samuel realized, it's not Eli. The Lord's trying to speak to me. So Eli says, when God calls you, you need to say, speak. Verse 10, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, until I feel like you're speaking to me, then I will hear. Then Samuel answered, until you're preaching the sermon that I really need, then I will hear. Then Samuel answered, I am already hearing God, so it's okay. No, Samuel answered and said, speak for thy servant heareth. You know what you need to do when you come to church? Lord, you set this up specifically for me. You need to speak to me today. I will have my ears open. Make me see it. Make me know it. Make me hear it. Make it reach me. How many have come to this service doing that? How many have come to this church, Lord? You, Lord, I'm hearing now, so speak to me. When's the last time you said, Lord, there's something you want me to hear. Let me see it. Ask and ye shall receive, the Bible says. You don't come in passively and say, until I hear something from God and I feel it, or the preacher does a better job in preaching, you know, and then does it in a way where it really reaches me, then I will hear. No, you come in saying, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. A pastor or a preacher can teach on something so off Something so boring and dull that you would think that, why, how can I get any conviction? Is the Lord speaking directly right at your heart? Every preacher is not the same way. There are some preachers you would think to be boring. There are other preachers who you would think to be too fleshly. Other preachers you would think to be too mean. Other preachers that just don't fit your mood and taste and God don't meet every one of your preferences. That's not how God, the Holy Spirit, moves, fella. You know how God moves? He'll use one of the most distasteful things against your flesh that no one will get any under, any, feel anything about. God can use those instruments to speak to you. He can use a donkey to speak. He can use the rocks to cry out. He'll use a dull, 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 lowly, unexpected instrument to speak to you. But are you hearing it? Or all you're seeing is a donkey? All you're seeing is a rock? All you're seeing is... Or do you see God speaking to you? You know what you need to do right now as I keep preaching? Speak, Lord. Yes, amen. Thy servant heareth. Or are you afraid, fella, to do that? You're afraid, aren't you? You're afraid the Lord's going to speak to you. The preacher's going to preach on something that will hit right at your weak area, that sweet spot that you always ran away from. You don't want the Lord to speak to you. And that's why the Lord will grant your wish and you can come every Sunday without hearing God speak to you. God will grant your desire. Come to church all you want. I can draw endless whiteboards. Do whatever you want and entertain you. And you can come to church being entertained rather than the Lord speaking to you. Wow. Preach. Wow. Are you, are you dreading really the Lord to speak to you? You thought you had ears to hear. You thought that you wanted the Lord to speak to you. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because you know if the Lord really spoke to you, there's something that you won't like. Go to Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. Do you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you, friend? Do you hear something that you need to get right with God? Do you hear something that you need to surrender to the Lord? Do you hear Him? Look at Revelation 2. Notice that God is writing to each of these churches. Now, I want you to pay very close attention, all right? 
You're Bible believers, all right? So <laughs> look at your verse. Pay attention, okay? See if I say anything wrong. Chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, Unto the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? Okay, someone's hearing. All right, let me continue on, though, just in case. Philadelphia, right, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have someone against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now keep your hand there. I want you to go to Revelation 3. Revelation 3. Pay attention, you're Bible believers now, okay? Revelation 3, 7. And to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Okay, someone's listening. Let me keep reading, though. To Ephesus write these things, saith he that is holy. He that is true. He that the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Now someone already pointed it out, but I've switched the churches. You notice that? Yep. Ephesus, when they're hearing the word of God, they needed to hear the instructions that was directly, specifically for them. And Philadelphia, when they're hearing the word of the Lord, they needed to hear what God specifically instructed them. But nowadays, people who think they're hearing the word of God, listen up now, they think they're hearing the word of God. I know thy works. I have set thee before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. And people think, that's right, I heard you, God. Amen. I'll keep that open door going. I'll keep serving you. I'll keep being zealous. But God's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not talking to you that. Yeah. I said, Ephesus, you, your problem is you do have too much zeal in open doors to serve me. And you left your, out your first love. Wow. That's huge, right? Yeah. That's really huge. But that's a, an example of a church who thinks they heard God speaking to them. But that, that wasn't God speaking to them. That's a great example of a church who thought they heard God instructing them, but they didn't really hear God instructing them. Why? Because they misapplied the instructions. They heard the wrong instruction. You know what the problem is in preaching of the word of God? When God is preaching to you, you think you got ears to hear and you're like, that's right, Lord. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. And that's not me. And that's not me. That's me. And that's not me. No, my friend. Sometimes what's sad is when you're hearing the preaching of the word of God, you're still not hearing what God is really saying to you. Preach. And that can be very dangerous. Preach. You might think that you're fired up for God, that you got an open door, that no man can shut it. And so we got to keep soul winning. We got to keep street preaching. We got to keep being zealous. Hey, man, what if the Holy Spirit's telling you, no, that is your problem. Your problem is you're too zealous. You're serving God in church, being so faithful, but you left out your first love because you were so lost in being zealous in the church, practicing piano, practicing music, practicing your sermon, preaching at the people, and then uh, setting up the offering, counting and going to street preaching and crossing out all, all the things that you're supposed to do. And you forgot that brother and sister in Christ sitting at the back who left the room, who never received any first love basic from you. Imagine coming to a person you never said hi to for months. You ever thought about that? There are some people here you probably never said hi to for months. You left your first love. Because you're so lost in the zeal. You are so lost in the singing, the preaching. You hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you? How about this one? Let's go back right here. <coughs> when we go to uh, verse 8. Verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. Look at verse 10. <coughs> Fear
Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Okay, that's what he said to Smyrna. He that ears to hear, let him hear. Okay? He that ears to hear, let him hear. Let's see if you'll catch it. Look at chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that the key of David, he that shutteth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. You kept my word and hast not denied my name. Did I get something wrong right there? Yes. Yes, thank you. Verse 7, I said Smyrna. No, that's not Smyrna, that's Philadelphia. Imagine if that was <coughs> Smyrna thinking in chapter 3, verse 7, Oh, God's speaking to me. He's right. I've served him so faithfully, and I've been suffering, and I only have a little strength left in this church. But God said, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Let's go all the way for Jesus. This world can't shut us down. We're going to keep winning souls. Set the communities ablaze. No, no, no. You're not Philadelphia. You're Smyrna. Sm what did God say to Smyrna in chapter 2? He didn't say, I set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. He said, you're going to die. Yeah. You're going to be faithful till death. What happened to the open door? What happened to people getting right with God in the church and we're doing something for Jesus? We're going to set the world on fire. That's not for you. Some of you think that as you're pushing yourself, whew, man, our, the Lord's blessing our church. We got so many souls saved and then we got so many things done. And then here am I suffering for Jesus Christ and I know I have a little strength, but I need to push myself and keep on going. Hey, no, 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 no. You're not the fired up church. You're the suffering church. And maybe the Holy Spirit's telling you, slow down. Maybe the Lord's telling you, you need to be faithful, just faithful. Yeah. Not find something more. Pastor, what can I do? I wish I can do something more. How can you do something more if you fail to do on the current things God has given to you to do? He said, be faithful what you got. You need to be faithful. Hold on. I know the suffering's tough, but just hold on. God will pull you through to the end and give you the victory. Be faithful till death. What about the open door that no man can shut it? Let God tell you that in his time. Not you deceiving yourself thinking that God told you that right now. You're a suffering church. You're not a fired up church. A time of waiting, patience, and not revival, but suffering. Not weekend revivals, not blowouts, not happy times in fellowship, but just suffering. Suffering. Why isn't a Sunday? Why wasn't it a good day at Sunday? Because you're a suffering church. We're not like this every Sunday. Let me give you bad news. Hear this. You need to hear this from me. Sunday is not like today. Do you understand that? Every Sunday is not like today. I wish it was, but it's not. When everyone is going through hard times and suffering and pain, they drag themselves to church. You can tell people are hurting as we sing, as they hear the preach, and as they fellowship. It's not like that every Sunday. Do you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you? It's just being faithful. You just play those, play that piano. You just play the instrument. You just sing. You just fellowship with people. You just keep faithfully coming. Not every day you're going to run around the aisles and think everything is happy-go-lucky. Just being faithful. You're not a fired up church. You're a suffering church. But don't switch it the other way either. Don't switch it the other way either where you think you're a suffering church when the Lord says you're a fired up church. Come on. When God says, I've set before you an open door. So you need to go on. I know you have a little strength, Revelation 3 says, but I've set you an open door. You need to press on. 
Everybody in this room is going to apply the sermon differently. Do you understand? Come on. Because God is speaking to you, not all of us together in one pot. Look at Revelation 2 again. Look at Revelation chapter 2 again. Uh, I'm going to read verse uh, Revelation 3, excuse me, Revelation chapter 3, and I'll read verse 14 for verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Amen. Lay out a problem right here. They're, they got too many goods. They're lukewarm. Amen. All right. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. See if you'll catch it again. Chapter 2, verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. Verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Did I read that wrong? Yes. I said Laodicea here when it should be Smyrna. But the problem is, is that there's a Laodicea in here who thinks God is speaking to them in Smyrna. You're suffering. The devil's attacking you, giving you a hard time. Just be faithful. So I'm just being faithful what I can. But God is telling you, no, your problem is you're too comfortable and you're lukewarm. And you use this suffering victimization mentality. The devil keeps attacking me. The de you think you're so special, fella, that you got a lukewarm attitude and you got to be fired up for me. I feel so sick of this little queasy little attitude. I just want to vomit you, spew you out of my mouth. Why? Because we're in the Bay Area. We're in Silicon Valley. Oh, we went through so much and <laughs> lukewarm. And God is probably telling you, hey, you don't, you're not a suffering church like you think you are. You're lukewarm. You're too comfortable. But then again, don't switch the directives of the Lord where you think, well, I got to do more for the Lord when you're actually suffering. And you need to wait. You need to be patient. Just be faithful what you got. He that ears to hear, let him hear. You, do you hear the Holy Spirit talking to you? Let's go here again. Let's go here again. The Bible says in chapter 3, verse 1, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And unto the angel of the church... In Thyatira, right. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Look at chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, right. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Verse 24, 24. But unto you I say un, unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. There was something that I slipped up when I read these two passages, right? Yes. Chapter 3, verse 1, he's speaking to Sardis, not Thyatira. Sardis' problem was they're a dead church. They're about to die. 
mean, they're just a dead church and God saying, you need to fire up yourselves. You're not even laid out to sin. You're Sardis. You're about to die. The church in Thyatira, they had the works. They had the charity. But it's just that they don't know much about the deaths of Satan, so God can't put upon them any other burden. How many Christians have I met who said, Pastor, I'm just cold. When I hear the preaching, when I fellowship, when I sing, when I do something for the Lord, I just feel cold. I feel dead. I'm so worried. I feel like there's no life in me. I'm afraid of losing my salvation because if I was genuine, why do I have these thoughts in my mind? Why do I feel like falling out? How can I be so wicked, Pastor? And God's like, hey, you're not Sardis. You're Thyatira. You do have your works. You do have your charity. Your problem is you just don't know much about the depths of Satan that you've fallen onto. So I'm not going to put upon you any other burden. What the problem with some Christians are, they think that with this mentality, I'm a dead Christian. I don't love Jesus Christ. I can't come to church anymore, so I won't come anymore. Hey, then why would you even have God in your thought to begin with? Right. Why would you be worried about losing your fire for the Lord? Why would you even care about the Bible then if you really don't care about the Bible? Why would you even ask that then to me? You're just Thyatira. You do have charity. You do have works. You just don't know much about the depths of Satan you've fallen unto. So you know what God says? You needed to hear this because you're not Sardis. Listen up. Do you have ears to hear? Hear this then. You're not Sardis. You're not dead. You're Thyatira. God says, I will put upon you no other burden. Do you hear that? God says, I won't put upon you any other burden. How do you feel now? God said, God knows you're so messed up. Look at Thyatira, so messed up with doctrines of Jezebel, fornication, idolatry. But God is merciful. He's understanding that the flesh is so messed up, so weak. So there are some things you need to repent, you need to get right with God, but know this, I'll be understanding. I won't give you a burden greater than you can bear. Amen. We'll pull this through together, this sin, this addiction, this weakness of yours, this horrible state you're in. We'll pull through together. Just get, to, get your tail to church and just come one day at a time. Amen. Come on. Amen. Just do this. You're not dead. You're not no. dead. I won't put you a greater burden than you can bear. Amen. Do you hear the Holy Spirit? Let's look at this again. Let's uh, look at uh, chapter 2. Uh, let's look at chapter 2 and then verse 1. Chapter 2 and verse 1. He that ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Unto the angel of the church of Pergamos, write. Verse 2. Verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. And hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labor and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Yeah. I read something wrong, right? I said Pergamos, but no, God is speaking to Ephesus. What's Pergamos' issue? Imagine Pergamos thinking, you know, we're so zealous for the Lord, but we can't forget our first love. Loving Jesus, loving others. Yes. So we got to fellowship with people. We got to be nice to them. We got to a minister to this wicked world. We got to care about lost souls. Have a burden. Amen. That sounds like really good stuff. That sounds like really good stuff. And like the brother said, lost souls. But maybe God's not speaking to you that way. Maybe God is saying to you, maybe God is saying to you, Pergamos, that's not your problem. Your problem is not you left your first love. Your problem is chapter 2, verse 14. Chapter 2, verse 12, excuse me, 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two ed edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Verse 14. 
But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Probably your problem is, Pergamos, you emphasize so much on love, love, not offending other people, trying to be considerate, that you need to realize you need to have some guts to tell them you're wrong. Yes. You need to have some guts to stand up to your family member, to your loved one, to the lost souls around you. You need to, have to, you need to guide them, show them what's right doctrine. Why do you compromise with them? Why do you have to be a yes person all the time and say, yes, that's okay, oh, I get that. And especially in fellowship, where we're all together, we're supposed to believe in right doctrine. Why is it that we don't have the courage, the love, the care to set the people in order on what's right doctrine, to guide them? I'm not telling you to be mean. I'm not telling you you're wrong. And sometimes it's not the right time to say it. I get it. Yeah. But man, sometimes we, uh, th then we forgot why we separated from those 90% of churches. Right. You know why we separated from them? They tolerate every wrong doctrine with love. You know why you came to this church? Not because I preached something that really spoke to you. You want right doctrine. Amen. Truth. That's why you came here to begin with. But we watered it down with love, love, and love. You forgot your stance, why you even came to this church. Not for kids program, not for fellowship, not for something that where you feel the love of Jesus. Those, though those are good things, yes. but that's not why you came to this church to begin with. Because it's right. This is the only church I can find that's preaching, teaching what's right. Everything that I go to is yes. just wrong, 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 wrong. Amen. Amen. That way, even one day, God forbid, there's no love in this church, you'll still stay stuck in this church. And even if somebody hurts your feelings, even the pastor, you might just still stay stuck and committed and faithful to this church. Because you came here for truth anyway, not for Gene Kim to smile and make you feel good. Amen. Don't we have a family to take care of? How can husbands not be able to take responsibility to get their wives and children set in right doctrine? Why can't parents have the guts nowadays to set their children in order and right doctrine and tolerate all kinds of worldly things to fill up their bedrooms and in their lives? Why is it nowadays that pastors and members have been shallow and have not been able to stand in right doctrine and make sure that the members come in in right doctrine? I'm not saying to be unwise with people in here, not to be mean, but I won't compromise on what's wrong and tolerate fornication. I won't tolerate some kind of sins and let those things slip in. Some of you have been confronted with that by me. I would say, look, you got to change that one. You got to change that one. If you still don't get the memo from the preaching after many years. If you don't get that, then I have to do my job. I have to tell you, sorry, you're wrong. I have to tell you in counseling, sorry, you're wrong. The problem is, no, uh, we lack love in this church. No, the problem is, you can't take in right doctrine or truth. And you're a Bible believer. You're King James only dispensational. Sure. Whatever truth fits your truth, then you're okay. But not in truth that really hurts your feelings. That's uncomfortable to you. You don't want the ugly truth, which is why at the very beginning, you don't want God to speak to you. Because you know exactly what God will say to you that will be the ugly truth. Yes. Read. Read. He that ears to hear, let him hear. Read this one. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. And verse 14. 14. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, Verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I read something wrong, right? Lay out the sand. Lay out the sand. You know what the problem is now? Okay? Some people might think, man, I'm not right with God. I'm lukewarm. We need to get some things right with God in the church. But Philadelphia... God is not speaking to you. God is speaking to Laodiceans here. 
What is Philadelphia, God said? A door that no man can shut. A church that's right with God. So keep up that good work. You know what the problem is? The problem is you think you're lukewarm. You think God's about to spew you out of your mouth, but God is saying, no, you're doing a good job. You're growing. You're cleaning some things you never cleaned off before. We're fired up. Keep on going. Amen. And God is saying that to you right now, but you're just too deaf to hear it. And you beat yourself up and you're so hard on yourself. Man, I got to do more. I got to do more. I messed up. I got to do more. I'm not like pastor over there or brother or sister so-and-so right there. I got to do more. Hey, God says, no, you're doing a good job because I just opened a door where you're growing, Amen. where you're progressing. Just Amen. keep ongoing. Not, oh, there's so much and I messed up. I backslid in. And... No, God just say, just keep going. Amen. And that's the reason why churches beat themselves up and the members enslave each other, beat each other up on why aren't we righteous enough? Why aren't we doing more for the Lord? Why are we so backslidden? Maybe God's saying, no, this is a growing church. You're doing well. Just keep going. That's it. Amen. Don't beat each other up. Maybe you needed to hear that. He that years to year, let him hear. Now, the doctrinal application, chapter 2 and 3, is speaking to tribulation saints. We can see a lot of examples from that one. That is tribulation doctrine. For example, chapter 2, verse 26 through 27, talks about overcoming until Jesus Christ reigns on the earth. He comes down for the tribulation saints. Another example is chapter 2, verse 9, where it literally says tribulation, and they have to endure. Another example is chapter 2, verse 17. They have to overcome to get their new name written and a hidden manna. Christians don't have to do that. Our names are already written in the book of life. So this is a lot of tribulation doctrine right here. Now, I have a question. Why? Would God write to these seven churches and let these letters who are supposed to apply for those churches carry on to the tribulation? Why would God do that? Unless God knew that there are people in the tribulation who have been influenced by some things or who follow the pattern and the example of some things who have the similar weakness of Thyatira, Ephesus, Sardis, Laodicea. You know what that speaks volumes of? It speaks volumes that even though God is speaking to this church, he knows that centuries, if not millennia later, there are people who will follow this church's example. If there's one thing we need to learn, listen up, church. Bible Baptist Church does not only apply to people in this church. Do you understand? The things we do in this church will carry on to your children who are watching you. Every visitor who comes here who's watching you. Every lost soul who's watching you in street preaching and you witness to in visitation. Every person you tried to bring to church but they walked away mad or they never came back again. Our example, what we do in this church has carried on to many other people. And it can go on for centuries. Wow. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, whether we like it or not, our good or sin, good or sin, we do have an influence on other people around us unconsciously. And those people learn it from us. They take those things from us and they infect other people around them with that same influence. One person cusses, you'll get a whole room cussing eventually yep. as time passes by. Right. You get one person soul winning, you get every other person around the room soul winning. You, yeah. get, you yeah. get watered down in your Christianity, every other person will water down. You lose the love of Jesus Christ and for others in this room, every other person will follow that. If, God forbid, but let's say that Many years pass by after this church. What can we leave in this community behind? Wow. Wow. 
What kind of influence will we leave? Wow. You have to understand this. If you don't hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you and you don't change those weaknesses of yours or those wow. things God wants you to hear, uh, you see a little bit of your little ones. You see people around you, fellow Christians even, who take those weaknesses with them from you. Wow. But if you take in what the Holy Spirit gives to you, those other people will take what they got from the Holy Spirit as well. Amen. It lasts for generations, for centuries, millennia. Wow. That's evidence of history. I don't see any difference with our church from the book of Judges. I don't see any difference from our church from even all seven churches. I don't see any difference. There are some things that we have sadly been influenced by because of the faults and the weaknesses of churches before us and the nation of Israel before us. What men learn from history is that men never, men never learn from history. Yep. And we unfortunately do that in our lives today. What you do when you come on this altar will determine for generations to come and even people around you. Do you hear the Holy Spirit calling? Wow. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Every head bow and every eye shut.